my name is Ashley Trout. I'm the winemaker and owner of Brook and Bowl Cellars, and I'm the winemaker and founder for Vital Wines out of Walla Walla, Washington. And we're here today to talk about why rosé, of all wines, is technically the hardest wine to make. Now, I'm going to contradict myself sentence one and say that I think rosé is the hardest still wine to make. I think sparkling wines are maybe a little bit harder to make, but if we're dealing in the still category, it's definitely rosé, which is interesting because it's probably pretty regularly the least expensive wine you buy and drink off the shelf. Uh, it's also had just an enormous growth in sales in the United States, so it's grown by about 50%, 40% every year for the last five years. That's crazy uh, in, Wash in uh, the United States. Sorry, I'm from Washington. But all of the United States has been drinking a lot of rosé lately, uh, which I think is great. But it's really important to talk about rosé from uh, the standpoint that it is very hard to make because one thing that's happening with this expansive growth is you have a lot of really bad rosé hitting the shelves. So as consumers really demand a lot of rosé, winemakers are able to respond to that quickly with rosé specifically because we don't hold on to it for two years before releasing it in the same way that we do for um, reds, right? Um, so when you talk about wine trends, it's really hard to keep up with wine trends for the most part. Rosé is the one exception because that quick turnaround. And if you've got a whole lot of people all of a sudden making rosé, and it's really hard to make, then you're going to have a market filled with really, really bad rosé. Um, and we do sometimes. Uh, so let's talk about why rosé is really, really hard to make. Um, you have to make it heat stable. And I brought a heat unstable wine. Um, it's, it, it gets really cloudy. Um, when it's heat unstable. And I'm, I tried to bring you a heat unstable wine. I think I did too good of a job because not only is this one cloudy, but it also has sediment in it. Like it was so heat unstable that the cloudiness kind of turned into actual sediment, which isn't normally what you're gonna see. What you'll see is more just cloudy wine. So what heat stability is, is uh, it's a protein instability. It's not bad for you. It doesn't taste bad. It just looks really weird, and, and it makes you want to not buy the wine. Um, from a producer's standpoint, if you're going to make a wine that you know people aren't going to buy, it's a problem. So we have to focus on heat stability, whether we want to or not. Um, and with reds, we don't have to do that, because you're drinking heat, unstable wine possibly all the time, but it's opaque, so you don't know, and it's not your problem. So heat instability happens when you get these proteins kind of unfurl. And when you have enough proteins in the wine unfurl, they find other friends. And then when you get enough of that happening, it goes cloudy. The reason that there are more proteins in a wine from one year to another is grapes will make protein, they'll make enzymes as a protective barrier to fight anything that's trying to attack that plant during the growing season. So mold and mildew or really anything that's, I mean, you know, nature is crazy, right? So all sorts of things are coming after that plant all the time and, and it's trying to fight that. And so it produces these enzymes, these proteins, and, um, and then you get into a problem when you don't have a heat stable wine. The way you take care of heat stability or heat instability is you can fine it, um, but that's kind of a bummer because then you're taking out a lot of good stuff with the bad stuff. It, always, when you're finding something, you take out good stuff with the bad stuff. You can't just choose. Uh, that would be nice if you could, but you can't. Um, and then the other way to do it is you can have a really sort of warmer fermentation. And that, that works to get a lot of those protein issues taken care of. But you also kind of cook out a lot of the really interesting notes that you would find in, in a wine um, when you do one of these hotter fermentations. So anyway, that's heat instability. 
Um, if you ever see a cloudy wine, don't freak out. It's, it could be pretty good. It's not bad for you either. Uh, it won't hurt you. Drinking too much of anything might hurt you, but the cloudiness won't hurt you. So the other one is um, cold instability. So uh, what you get when you have a cold unstable wine is potassium bitartrate crystals. And I, I brought a white wine, not a red. I wanted, I mean, not a rosé. I wanted a rosé, but um, all I could find on the tight turnaround to get here was a, a cold, unstable white wine. So you can see, maybe, I don't know if you can get in there, uh, the crystals. So these are potassium bitartrate crystals, and they are exactly the same thing as cream of tartar. So if you stick your finger, if you lick your finger and stick it in a thing of cream of tartar and then lick it again, that's this, exactly. So again, it's not bad for you. Um, and if you were to find it in a red wine, you wouldn't freak out, you know, sort of on the, on the cork, on the edge of the cork, you find all sorts of things. You find all sorts of sediment on the edge of a, of a red wine cork and you think, oh, how nice, it's this, it's this beautiful boutique, unfined, unfiltered, amazing red wine and aren't we so lucky to be drinking it. You people at large do not give whites and rosés the benefit of the doubt when you find crazy things on the cork. So we as producers need to acknowledge that and be honest with ourselves and really try to make our wines cold stable and heat stable. One kind of horror story that I was told uh, is that Germany, I think in the 80s or the 90s, um, tried to educate their public about it's okay to drink cold, unstable wine. And they did this neat thing on marketing, wine crystals, it's okay to drink wine crystals, and they're right, it's okay to drink wine crystals. Um, the incentive they had was, it's kind of expensive to cold stabilize wines, and Germany was making a lot of white wine at the time. Uh, it, you, you can stick your wines outside for free and hope that the temperature is gonna give you exactly what you want, but that's a lot of guesswork or you can cool your tank of wine with like a, like a jacketed tank. So kind of, you know those thermoses, those vacuum sealed thermoses that you have that has the, the liquid that you're actually drinking on the inside and then like a space uh, along the edge and then the actual thing that your hand touches. Well in that space, wineries will run glycol through there and that glycol never ever touches the wine but you can dial in the temperature. Um, to exactly, glycol is great for holding the exact temperature that you want. So you sort of snake it around the tank and you dial in the temperature. Well, glycol is expensive. So Germany wanted to, to save money and they educated the public. It's okay to drink cold unstable wine, go for it. Everybody jumped on board and they did it. And then some huge winery uh, had, a, had a mishap on their bottling line and started bottling wines with like little tiny shards of glass. The glass was breaking as they were bottling it, which is just horrific to think about. And I don't think after that, anybody has any chance of ever successfully marketing wine crystals again. Uh, I'm not gonna try today, but that's a pretty great story. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you. Um, and what's, what's interesting about uh, all of this is that Rosé is really, it's, it's inexpensive, right? And I'm gonna go on for a little bit longer about why rosé is really hard to make because there are other reasons. But if you think about it, it's one of the least expensive wines you drink and yet uh, it's one of the hardest to make. The reason it hits the shelf at a really inexpensive price point is because uh, it, we don't hold onto it for very long and so we're not paying real estate, right? We're not paying rent on those tanks or those barrels for very long. And also, we don't, we don't put it in oak, right? So oak's very expensive. Barrels can be about $2,000 each, and then you get about 25 cases out of that barrel. Oak, oak can really add up, especially uh, depending on if you're trying to oak a lot of stuff. So anyway, long story short, rosé um, tends to hit the shelf at a, at a lower price point for those two main reasons, in addition to some other small reasons. So another reason that rosé is really hard to make is it's kind of like a caprese salad. 
you have fewer ingredients and so you have to nail all of them. You're not, you're not sticking the old cucumber in the caprese salad, right? It's, it's very naked, it's gonna show, it's a big problem. Well, rosé is the same way. You have, as far as ingredients go, you have kind of the yeast esters that you were working with, and then you also have, um, you have acid, uh, you have color, and I'll get into that in a second, but color is not really a an, an taste ingredient, right? So when you're looking at the taste of something, you're looking at acid, uh, some, of the, some of the fruit profile, some of the yeast profile, but you don't have tannin as an option, you don't have oak as an option. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of flavors that aren't necessarily at your disposal to work with, with rosé, a lot of components. Um, so uh, another um, reason why it's really hard to make rosé is you know that everybody has a magnifying glass on the color, right? So with a white wine, people kind of look at the color. With a red wine, they never look at the color, rarely, except if it's like a very oddly light red and then you kind of get concerned. But with the exception of very end of the spectrum situations, nobody's looking at the color, except for rosé. So take a look at these three. These are extremely different colors. And I'm sure once you started watching this video, it, it popped out to you. People really pay attention to the color of rosé. So as a winemaker, you need to get it right, whatever right is, whatever you're going for. Uh, and you have very little time to do that. When we look at a fermentation for a red wine, it's usually, gosh, anywhere from a week to three weeks that we're, that we're dealing with that maceration on the skins to give it color. With a rosé, you're dealing with zero minutes to a day at most. So you have to absolutely nail when you press off of the skins and get your color because that's it, you've done it. There are some real Frankenstein ways to get a different color later, but I'm just gonna assume for the good of all of us that those things aren't happening. Uh, so you don't have any time, right? And, uh, and then speaking of not having any time, you, you also go to bottle a lot earlier. So one of the few ingredients that I did mention that you have in a rosé are those fermentation esters. So the smells that come off of a certain type of yeast strain, you're gonna hold on to at a rate of uh, about, um, they kind of, half of them die off about every six months, which is why you don't see a lot of really old rosé on the market for a couple of different reasons. The color starts to go brown and all sorts of things, but, um, but you really wanna retain those fermentation smells. They're pretty nice and interesting and beautiful and they, they add complexity. So in order to retain those, you're gonna really wanna go to bottle early. Now, the problem with going to bottle early is wine is kind of like a house plant. When you go water it, it takes a day or two to notice that you've watered it and it, it doesn't perk right back up. Uh, and wine's the same way. So if you're harvesting in September or even August and you go to bottle in January, that's incredibly fast as far as winemaking timing. So you don't have any time to make a mistake because you, you are going to bottle and you have to bottle um, with it all dialed in the right way because once something goes in the bottle, um, very few things are gonna change. So it's, it's important that you don't make any mistake and then Really, as you get sort of late in the winemaking process, often with a red wine, <clears throat> if you're not super thrilled with what you've got, whether it's not enough acid or not enough tannins or even not enough color or not enough mouthfeel, you can look through your cellar and see if there's a barrel of something that's gonna blend in and really give you what it is that you're missing. Well, with rosé, you can't, you can't do that because very few of us have a cellar full of different rosés to choose from, right? So for all these reasons, uh, you don't have time to mess up. You don't have anywhere to hide flaws. You have to absolutely make something beautiful w without, without the ability to, um, to fix things. And meanwhile, it, it hits the shelves at this really, really low price point and people don't take it seriously. So 
people who do a lot of rosé, they're kind of a sucker for, for punishment. Um, they just want, they just want to get something beautiful made, but um, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Uh, so anyway, that's, that to me is pretty fascinating. Um, as far as rosés, I wanted to show you a couple of examples of sort of the, the variation of color. Ott is kind of the, the classic Provence high-end scale rosé. Um, I brought Vital, which is my nonprofit winery. We, we make a rosé. We do for Brook and Bull as well, which is my normal label. And then the Tavel. You'll see a lot of Tavel rosé as well. It's a little bit darker. Um, but you've got all sorts of amazing producers throughout the U.S. and throughout France and Spain and even Italy is making a lot of rosato now. So there are a lot of really fun choices. But the next time you go to the grocery store or the wine shop or wherever you are, please give rosé a little bit of credit. It deserves it. And uh, if you're ever interested, join us on Instagram or Facebook or the website or come visit us in Walla Walla for Vital Wines and Brook and Bull Cellars. And thank you for having me.